So, you know, we're glad, glad you're still watching. Uh, if you have phone calls, I know Caleb didn't take any phone calls, so phone lines will be open momentarily, but we're glad you're with us. want to give you our content information. Uh, word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you reach me at email, 276-340-2653. We meet at 250 the Boulevard in uh, Eden, and we have our Bible studies on Sunday, Sundays, uh, 9 and 10, and then Thursday nights at 7. We'll be glad for you to come out and, and visit with us and uh, assemble with us and study God's Word with us. We're going through the book of 1 Corinthians right now in, uh, um, in our studies on Thursday night, so we're glad you come out. hope you could come out and study with us, or you can... Uh, Assemble with the folks at uh, 823 Starling Avenue or 120 American Legion in uh, Martinsville and Danville. And I know they'd be glad to see you as well. So we hope that you will take advantage of all the, the times you have to study God's Word with people who love the book. Tonight is the eve of getting a new president. Make America Great Again was the slogan that we heard from Mr. Trump. And, uh, you know, as you think about a change and new, new, new uh, faces, new administration, people in, in power, the Bible says pray for the kings and them, those that are in power. So we should be praying for uh, the ones that are going out and the ones that are coming in and not just the president, but all the people all the way down to the city council. But make America great again, that's a pretty catchy slogan, and a lot of people like that because everybody wants to be great. But it just made me think, you know, what, what is really going to make America great again? What about Donald Trump's going to make America great again? I mean, he's a man, right? Oh, he's got an R after his name and not a D. Okay, is that what's going to make it great again? What's really going to make America great again? Well, I think you need to stop and consider that there's a lot of history with great nations. I mean, there are a lot of great nations that had a lot of history. So when we're talking about what's going to make America great again, well, what is Donald Trump going to do that the past, however many, what is it, 40, 45, 44 presidents that have, done, have, not, have or have not done? What's, what's, going to, what's, what's he going to do differently? I mean, what's going to make me great on January the 20th when he takes the oath of office? What's going to start making America great again? Is it going to be no more Obamacare? Hey, if they get rid of Obamacare, I'm all for it. I think that will help America. But that's not going to make America great again. More jobs? You know, we need people who are working. We need more people who are working and getting off the, the government dole. That's the welfare system. Individuals who can work but won't work, they need jobs. So if there's more jobs that come in as a result of the new president, hey, America will be better. I don't know that's going to make America great. I don't know that that's going to make America great again, though. What's going to make it? What's going to make America great? A new wall? Build a wall. Is that what's going to make America great? Listen, there are a lot of great nations in the past. If we look at them and find out what made them great. We're, we might have an idea about what's going to make America great. So let's start with this. Let's start with some that you read about in the Bible. Let's start with Babylon. Now, this is really an empire, I guess you might say, a world power. But you know what? The United States is a world power as well. Well, we have a very powerful army. We have a very powerful military. We have a lot of influence. I don't know if that's for good or bad in the world. But no one can dispute whether you like the United States or not. The United States is a world power. So was Babylon. Babylon was a great nation. Listen to what, what Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4 and verse 30. Nebuchadnezzar is walking out in, uh, in his kingdom. All right, He walks out. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon? that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and the honor of my majesty. Now, when you stop and think about what Nebuchadnezzar accomplished, Babylon was a great, it was a great nation. I mean, it was a great, great empire. It was a great, great nation. And when you stop and think about all the things that he accomplished, I mean, he was set up, he was set up uh, in a great way by his father, 
uh, Nebo Placer. And so Nebuchadnezzar, man, he had, he had things going his way. I mean, he was, he was a great, great king. And uh, so you might say, well, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. You know, he's a very powerful man. Look what he did. He built the Hanging Gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He built this for his wife. He built this for his wife, who was from up in the, uh, I guess, modern day. It's up in the, uh, the mountains of northern Iran, I think, uh, or Iraq. And it's, you know, uh, mountains region. And so he built these great hanging gardens for her. <clears throat> it's one of the seven wonders of the world, ancient world. I mean, he had, he had animals, he had plants, he had, I mean, it was just, I don't know, it was the Trump Tower of his day, I guess. I mean, he had it. Boy, he, he built it. Why? Well, because he was a great man. He had a great kingdom. He made Babylon great. Not only that, <clears throat> not only that, you know, we heard talk about building a wall. Uh, President Trump's going to build a wall. You know what one of the other wonders of the ancient world was? It was the walls of Babylon. Now, in the Bible, we read about, you know, we, we, when we think about the walls of a city, everybody thinks about Jericho's walls falling down. Hey, that's a pretty, pretty awesome wall, too. But the walls of Babylon were also considered as one of the great wonders of the ancient world. Particularly, particularly the gate. Particularly the gate. This is the, the Ishtar gate. Uh, it was the eighth gate to the inner city of Babylon. All right? It was constructed about 525 uh, B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it was on the north side of the city. And this is actually a, uh, a wall that has been reconstructed. This is the actual gate. Uh, it's been, been excavated. It's uh, reconstructed. Uh, and it's in the uh, Pergamon Museum in Berlin. And the gates of Ashtar, the gates of Ishtar, and the walls of Babylon, some say should still be considered one of the wonders, or the one, two of the wonders of the ancient world. Now that's just how, how impressive it is. You can tell, that here's, the, here's the people down here. These are people that are actually standing there in this museum looking at this reconstructed uh, gates of, of Ishtar, that was excavated by archaeologists uh, uh, from Babylon, ancient Babylon. So you can tell, I mean, this has got to be, I don't know how, how, that, how high that is. That's, that's, uh, surely that's 40, 50 feet high, 60 feet high. I don't know if, this, if these people down here, let's say they're, if they're six foot tall. And so you can tell, man, this is a great wall. Well, you know what? Isn't that what our new president's going to do? He's going to build a great wall? And he even said, hey, it's going to have a big, pretty, beautiful door to let people in. Is that what's going to make America great? No, hey, I'm, I'm all for building a wall. I think we should secure our borders. I think people that are coming in illegally should not be allowed to come in. I think people who are here illegally should be uh, deported. If you want to come in, you come through the proper channels. I'm all for immigration. I'm all for people visiting, but hey, let's... Come in through the door, not through the window. All right? But my point is, Nebuchadnezzar built a great wall and he put a great, beautiful door in it. Is that what made Babylon great? Well, in some people's eyes, it was. I think if, if, if President Trump, President-elect Trump, if he builds a wall and puts a big, beautiful door in it, you know what? <coughs> I think people are going to say, hey, America is great. They have a wall. But friends, that's, that's really not what made Babylon great. Or that may be what made it great, but that wasn't the greatest thing. You know what made Babylon great? What made Babylon great was their, their power, their military power. Look at this. In Jeremiah 46, in Jeremiah 46, verses 1 and 2, the word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates in Carchemish, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that's Nebuchadnezzar, different spelling of his name, king of Babylon, smote in the fourth year 
of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. Now Pharaoh Necho killed Josiah, and then Nebuchadnezzar killed uh, Pharaoh Necho at Carchemish. So the the domain in which uh, you have the the Babylonian Empire, the uh, the land mass, you might say, the area covered is a great military power. Nebuchadnezzar he 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 conquered a lot of a lot of territory. So he could defeat one of the greatest military powers of the day, which was Egypt, and <clears throat> he uh, 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 procured or he, he uh, secured all the, the trade routes all through his kingdom, all through Palestine, all up through the uh, Mesopotamian Valley. He controlled all that, so he was in charge of all of the uh, all the trade goods, you might say, the commerce. Now, so... Was this what made uh, Babylon great? Hey, we're told, we're told by the new president that's coming in, we're going to make America great again. We're going to bring new jobs, commerce, trade, right? We're going to get fair deals. We're not going to be cheated by all these other countries. We're going to build a great wall. Oh, is this President Trump or is this President Nebuchadnezzar? Sounds very similar, right? Now, my point is, listen, I, some of you uh, folks out there getting mad. You, I'll talk about my president, Donald Trump. I'd vote for Trump. I don't care who you voted for. This is my point. My point is the things that our president-to-be is promising are things that have been done in nations for years and thousands and thousands of years past. And that may, may have made those nations great to a certain extent. But where is Babylon today? That's my point. If it's so great, where is it today? You can read about it in the history books. You can see pieces of it that have been dug up out of the dirt in museums, right? But where is it today? That's my point. It was so great, it was so wonderful, it was so beautiful. Where is it today? Where is it today? You see, what Nebuchadnezzar didn't realize is you don't get to last. What you do is not going to last necessarily. That's not the most important thing. We read Daniel 4 and verse 30. Daniel 4 and verse 30. And I want you to notice the context of this. Daniel 4 and verse 30. When Nebuchadnezzar said this, when he said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built my, for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and the honor of my majesty. You know what he said when he said that? He said that 12 months. That's one year after he was told by Daniel the meaning of a dream. Now let's back up and look at this. Let's back up and look at what Daniel tells him. In, uh, well, let's just come on. Let's go ahead and just tell the dream here. Verse 19, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be told, Daniel's going to tell him the dream and then tell the interpretation. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was a stony for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not thy dream, nor the interpretation uh, uh, thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Verse 20, the tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong, whose height reached into the heaven, and the sight thereof of all the, in the sight of all the earth, whose leaves were fair and fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwell, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had uh, made their uh, habitation. It is thou, O king, Thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth into heavens and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Oh, it's a great, great kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, you're a great, great king over a great, great kingdom. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and say, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, uh, even with a band of iron and of brass and the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven 
and that his portion be with the beast of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High which is come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thou shalt be with, uh, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and thou shalt uh, make thee to eat grass as oxen, and shall, uh, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven till seven times pass over thee, till thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So Daniel just gives the dream, and says, "Here's what's going to happen." The dream means you're going to be cut down, but you're not going to be totally removed, but you're going to be in the field eating grass like an ox, and you're going to go crazy for seven years until you learn that you are not the top dog. Daniel says, And whereas they commanded thee to leave the stump of the tree, and the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor that it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So Daniel says, you need to repent. You need to get rid of your sins. You need to, you need to uh, uh, bring forth some righteousness. Get rid of your iniquities so that you can have peace. Now, Notice what it says. And at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the king of Babylon, kingdom of Babylon, and said, Is not this the great kingdom, great Babylon, that I have built for the house of the kingdom and for the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He didn't humble himself. And so as great as his kingdom was, he was brought low. And even after seven years passed, and he realized that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, where is Babylon today? That's my point. Even after he repented, even after he acknowledged that God is in charge of the kingdoms of men, where is Babylon today? And so greatness, friends, greatness of a nation is not always going to last. It's not always going to be the thing that... that uh, you can look at it and say, well, if we just do this, we'll be great. We'll have all the commerce. We'll have all the trade. We'll have all the, the jobs. We'll build a great wall with a big, beautiful door. <clears throat> That's not what made Babylon great. That's not what made Babylon great. Let's look at another, another nation. Greece. The Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire was a great world power. It came along, if you remember the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, the, uh, the great image, the head of gold and the, uh, the chest of silver and the, the uh, uh, legs and thighs of brass and then uh, the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay representing the four world powers that would come to pass. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar's empire was taken away and given to the Medo-Persians, it was gone. All we have of it is what's in museums. The Medo-Persians was destroyed by the Greeks. Alexander the Great came through and conquered that known world by the age of 33. Again, he was set up, put in a position of power by his father, Philip II, in Macedon, and, and he went about ruling the world, conquering the world. Everywhere he went, he named the city Alexandria after himself. A little cocky, don't you think? He liked to put his name on everything. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Do you think about another? Do you do you have in mind, or can you think of another, let's say, uh, powerful leader in the world that puts his name on everything? Maybe Trump. I, I don't know. Comes to mind. My point is, friends, I want you to consider these nations that are great by man's standards really aren't that great. Now, here's what happened to Greece. Now, Greece was great in the sense of Look what they accomplished. As a matter of fact, one of the great wonders of the world, the ancient world, is the great library at Alexandria. Now, technically it was built by Ptolemy, who was one of the generals of, of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great died. But uh, 
Ptolemy, he carried on the he carried on the tradition. He carried on what his uh, what his uh, leader would have wanted, and he built this great library. And the, the library at Alexandria uh, had let's just let me just read this here. It uh, said the library had a mission to collect a copy of every single book ever written. They collected copies of classical writers, correlated them, and came up with a text that was as close as they could get to the original material. Many ancient texts still survive to this day because they were collected, preserved, and stored at the Library of Alexandria. This library became the center of the Hellenistic or the Greek uh, empire. Now, look what they contributed. You know what? Their contributions to civilization were so great that even when, by the time Christ came along, by the time Christ was born, people were still speaking Greek. That's, that's how much the influence had. So you say, well, that was, a, that was a great contribution to the world. Oh, indeed it was. It surely was. But think about this. If Ptolemy built this great library of Alexand at Alexandria, and he did it really kind of in honor of, um, or built up Alexandria for in honor of Alexander the Great. <clears throat> what do presidents of the United States do? A lot of times when they get out of office, what do they do? Hey, let's build a library. You ever wonder why that's the case? Why is it the case that presidents are always building libraries? Well, I think it's a, it's a monument to themselves. It's a monument to themselves. Aristotle, Aristotle said he taught the kings of Egypt that they should build libraries to preserve the literature and the wisdom of whatever of their, uh, of their reigns and rules, whatever, to preserve history. And that's kind of a tradition that keeps going on, especially with our presidents. Now, is that what made America great? Is that what makes America great? Everywhere we go, you have, a, you have a presidential library. I guess you have a presidential library or something for just about every president we've ever had. I hadn't checked that out, but it seems like everyone I think of, they've got, a, they've got some kind of, uh, of library. But is that, what made, is that what made Greece great? Is that what made the Grecian Empire great? Is it the education? Is, is that what makes uh, a, a nation great? Listen. In the United States of America, our education system is so messed up, it's not even funny. We have things like common core curriculum that particularly the math part is so confusing that teachers don't even know how to use it. And because the public school system, the public school system has just become a, a vessel, if you will, not to educate people, it never was, really. If you look at the founders, the ones that, that uh, uh, put forth the idea of a public education system, it was not, they say, it was not to make the people pe men of letters and numbers. It was not designed to give them an education. It was designed to get them to take orders, to follow rules. It wasn't for their well-being. It was like we want to train them. Hey, you've got to go to school. You've got to, you've got to follow the rules. What have we done? We've prepared them. We've prepared them. Our school system is not working. You know, a lot of, in a lot of the major cities, the, the dropout rate is so high that students, oftentimes what they do, they wind up going from school to prison. They're not helping them. The school system is not helping. Teachers are, teachers are, are in unions that... Uh, won't let you get fired, especially in a higher, a higher education system. you got teachers that are tenured. They can't be fired. Is that what's going to make America great? Everybody have a piece of paper, has a college degree. Is that what's going to make America great? We have college, <coughs> college graduates that can't even find jobs. But, oh, they got a piece of paper. Is that what's going to make America great? Education? Is that what's going to make us great where we can uh, count and read and write and we have all these uh, diplomas? Is that what's going to make us great? No doubt about it, we need to be literate. No doubt about it, 
you know, you need an education, and education is going to help you to be better in life. But my point is this, friends. Where is the great education? Where is the great uh, benefit from literature? Where, where is that to the Grecian Empire? Again, you can read about Greece, Grecian Empire. You can read about it in the history books. You can touch pieces of it in the museum. But where is it today? As a matter of fact, the nation of Greece today, the nation of Greece today is in such financial ruin, you know, they're, they're going bankrupt if they hadn't already gone bankrupt. Now, where, how has that helped? You see my point? My point is we're putting stock in things that we think will make America great. How'd that work out for, for Greece? How'd that work out for the Grecian Empire? A world power in its day. Where is it? It's gone. Make America great again. What about Rome? Here's another world power. Listen, Rome, man, Rome was, they were a monster. I mean, you talk about building walls and building roads. I mean, Rome had it down pat. You know, I would, I don't know, but I would say Rome probably gave the United States a run for its money. I don't know how many roads there are in, in the United States. I guess we probably do have more than the Roman Empire. But do you remember where we got the interstate system? The interstates that run north and south and east and west? You know, all interstates that run east and west are multiples of 10. You got I-10, I-20, I-30, I-40, I-50, I-60, so forth. And if they run north and south, they're fives for the most part. There's a 77 and a whatever, but you got 95 and 35 and 45. Where, where did the interstate the, It was the, the, the brainchild, the brainstorm of, of President Eisenhower. Here's a president, another president. Hey, let's make America great. What are we going to do? We need to build roads where we can increase commerce, where we can increase trade, where we can get our, market, our, our goods to markets, where people can buy and sell, and we can be prosperous. Did that make America great? Well, it made it great in some degrees. I know when, I, when I'm traveling... I like to get on the interstate. Whoosh. Boy, I like that. I like getting on the interstate cruising, boy. <clears throat> you can just move right along. You don't have to stop at all these little red lights. Interstate system, love it. That makes America, That is one of the reasons why America is, America is great. But Rome did the same thing. You know, there's a saying, all roads lead to Rome, and there's a reason for that. It's because they were always building Rome. Over uh, roads over 500 years, they built over over 50,000 miles of highways and 200,000 miles of lesser roads. And they didn't didn't just plow a road and let it be dirt and mud. No, they dug down. They dug trenches. They laid a bed of of rock. They covered it with another layer of rock. They I mean they were they were road builders. As a matter of fact. Uh, <clears throat> They had it down to a science. If you look at Acts chapter 28, Acts 28 and verse 15, when Paul is headed to Rome, Luke records and says, From thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appi, the Appi Forum, and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. The Appian way was part of the road in which Paul traveled to get to Rome. And you know the Appian Way is still used, and part of it is still in use today. The Appian Way at some point, at some places, was 17 feet wide. <clears throat> now I haven't measured the roads out here, but 17 foot's a pretty wide road. You can, you can meet two cars on it pretty easily. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying the Roman Empire had roads. The Roman Empire had a an interstate system, if you will, right? The Roman Empire, they, they emphasized or they facilitated commerce and trade amongst, the, uh, amongst their citizens. 
Did that make a, did that make Rome great? That sure helped. What what happened when I think it was uh, <clears throat> President Grant you know laid out the challenge and two railroads, one from the east and one from the west, met and put a railroad track across the United States. Did that help America? Oh, it helped it. It helped it. But did it make it great? Depends on how you're looking at it. See, <clears throat> when men say we're going to make America great, is that really how you make America great? I want you to consider something, my friends. I want you to consider something. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 25, <clears throat> Paul gives us a reminder that sometimes we think things are one way and God has a whole nother idea about things. <clears throat> In other words, the things that we think will make America great are not what's going to make America great. <clears throat> Donald Trump comes in and he says, we're going to make America great again. We're going to bring back jobs. We're going we're to keep companies from going overseas. We're going to build a great, big, beautiful wall, put a big, beautiful gate on it. Those are all fine, well, and good. Will they help America? Yes. Will they benefit America? Yes. But that's not what makes it great. That is not what's going to make it great. Any more than Nebuchadnezzar's hanging gardens and great wall made Babylon great. It's not going to make America great any more than all the Roman roads made Rome great. It's not going to make America great <clears throat> any more than <clears throat> excuse me, all the education and the literature that's been preserved made the Greek Empire great. See, when you hear someone say, let's make America great again, you need to stop thinking about it like man thinks about it. Look what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25, he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man and the weakness of God is stronger than man. <clears throat> what, what is he saying here? In the context, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with an issue in the church at Corinth. It's a division. People are saying, well, I think this, I think that. This is my way, this is my way. And Paul says, you know what your problem is? The problem is you're not thinking about things God's way. He says, where is the wise Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now he's talking about spiritual things. Men think about things in a physical sense. But he says, look, that's not the way God thinks. He says, for after that is the wisdom of God, the world is by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. Friends, God does not look at things the way we look at them. And so when you hear a man say, let's make America great again, you need to stop and ask yourself, okay, is that the way God would make America great again? Because man's wisdom and God's wisdom, they don't line up. They don't line up. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Why? Why? Because God has a greater plan. I want you to consider this. When you say, let's make America great again, do you really stop and think about what will make a great nation in God's eyes? <clears throat> if you have a concordance, and I have, I have one on my computer, you can see us use it, but you type in the exact phrase, great nation, just put those two together. Great nation. Exact phrase. It's only found eight times in the Bible. Six of those times, it's in reference to God's people. 
Six of those times you'll find that great nation is in reference to God's people, Israel. It, does ne it never is referring, I don't say never, but it's not talking about, in those times, in those six times, it's not talking about the physical things. It's, it's not basing it upon what man would say. You say, well, what makes a great nation? Now listen, let me, have to take, uh, let me rephrase this. God did say to Abraham, I'll make thee a great nation. But I want you to consider what made them really great. It wasn't their numbers. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7 and verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. What made Israel a great nation? Wasn't their numbers. Now, relatively speaking, they were they came out of Egypt a great nation compared to how they went in. Right? When he went in, they were they're about 70, 75, I think I think 75 if you count Joseph was already there. So less than 100 people going in and coming out a great nation. So yeah, relatively speaking, that's a great nation. But compared to other nations, Israel, Israel wasn't a great nation numerically. They were nearly always outnumbered. So what made it great? It wasn't their numbers. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, the reason why God made them great, why God chose them, it wasn't because of their numbers. He chose them for another reason. He chose them because he made a promise to them. He made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to Abraham that he would make of his seed a nation. Notice this. He said, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred from thy father's house unto a land I will show thee, and I will make and I will uh, make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make them a great name, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now he says, Well, here's a great nation, yeah. But not numerically speaking, what was it that made him great? What has made them great? I will bless them to bless thee and curse them to curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. What was it that made Israel so great? Well, let's look at another verse here. Let's look at another verse. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this, nation, this great nation is a wise and understanding people, for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I do set before you this day? You see a connection here? What made this nation great was not how big the walls they built. It wasn't how great their secular education system was, their public school system. It wasn't how many PhDs they had amongst them. It wasn't, it wasn't how many roads they built, bridges they built, 
railroad tracks they built. That's not what made them great. What made them great is that they were given God's laws and they would be recognized as great if they kept those laws. They would be recognized, hey, these people are different from all other people. What, what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgment so righteous? They have the best laws there are because they came right from God. Everybody that sees you, God is telling them, everybody that sees you is going to say, hey, this nation, this nation is great. This nation is wonderful. What nation is there that's, that's like this? You see, greatness comes as a result of keeping God's law. In Psalms 9, verse 17, Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now, friends, when you hear someone say, let's make America great again, I don't want you to think about jobs or roads or buildings or walls or trade or military might. You got to think this. You want to make America great again? America needs to get back to what God says will make America great again. Now, how are we going to do that? How will you make America great? What is it? What is it that would make America that would make America great? America will be a great nation if it becomes a nation of God's people. Now, what do you mean by that, James? Ah, uh, that sounds like one of those lovey-dovey, wishy-washy, mushy-mushy preachers. Oh, we need to be all be a people of God. No, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about let's everybody go to church on Sunday, the church of your choice. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not going to make us a, a nation of God. I'm talking about a nation of God's people. Friends, do you realize that God's people is a nation? The church is a nation. The church is a nation. When you talk about the Lord's people, we're talking about a spiritual nation, a nation within a nation, a nation of all nations within a nation. Now, what do you mean by that? A nation of all nations within a nation. Look at this. In Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Israel, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mount of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. That is, people of all nations are going to come to it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And uh, he will teach us of his ways, and, he will walk, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What do you mean, James? What does that mean? That means out of all nations, people from all nations are going to come and be a part of the nation of Israel. Not physical Israel. Not physical Israel. I'm talking about spiritual Israel. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. We're not talking about a Jew according to the flesh and Gentiles. We're talking about becoming a nation that puts aside your physical nationality to become a citizen of a spiritual nation. For Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. 
Now what's Paul saying? He says it doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. In Christ Jesus, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're, it doesn't matter if you're Polish. It doesn't matter if you're Czechoslovakian. It doesn't matter if you're African. It doesn't matter if you're uh, German. It doesn't matter if you're uh, British. It doesn't matter if you're Canadian. It doesn't matter whatever you are. Chinese, Vietnamese, it doesn't matter. If you obey the gospel, you'll become a member of a spiritual nation. Notice what it says, and as many as walk according to this rule, that is the rule that it doesn't matter in Christ where you're from, what your nationality is. As many as walk according to this rule, peace on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Here is the spiritual nation. This is the great nation. A spiritual nation. And so if America is going to be great again, if you really want to make America, America great again, then everybody in America, if they were all part of this nation, the church, then America would be great again. If the Lord's church was growing and striving to uphold the, the doctrines that you read about in this book, then you know what? America would be great again. Because the church in itself is a nation. First Peter First Peter 2 and verse 9. Peter says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. A holy nation. Now, friends, stop and think about that. You want to know how to make America great again? It's not by it's not by what you build. It's not by how much money you make. It's about how closely you stick to this book. It's about being righteous. That's what's going to make the difference. That it means becoming a part of a holy nation. Now you say, well. If everybody just go back to church, if everybody just go back to church, we'd be, we'd be part of that holy nation. No. You're still missing it. Let me help you. Remember what God told Abraham? God told Abraham, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Notice what Paul says. up there. All right. Let's try one more time here. Galatians 3 and verse 7. The promise that God made Abraham, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Look at this. Paul says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Now, if you are a child of Abraham, then you're part of this spiritual nation. So then they which be of, the, of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now, notice this. Come on down to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. In other words, God made a promise to Abraham before the law of Moses. And the law of Moses was not going to make the promise that God made to Abraham of none effect. It didn't null and void it. It was just another law that God added. It did not null the promise. The promise was what God's always focused on, and that is that he is going to bless all nations. Wherefore then serve the law? What's the point of it? What's the point of the law of Moses? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, that's Christ, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. 
Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but of God. But God is one. Is the law against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture concluded all under sin, and the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, you were kept under the law, you were kept in faith, should unto uh, the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Now here it is, wherefore the school the law was the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, notice what he says. If ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, we're getting back to that promise of Moses to Abraham. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. A spiritual nation, spiritually descendant, spiritually children of Abraham, the spiritual Israel of God, the nation of Israel, not the physical nation, not that not that group of people that live over there in Palestine that was established in 1948 because everybody thinks that Israel today is God's chosen people. No, wrong. That's not, what, that's not the nation we're talking about. The great nation that's going to help our nation is the church. Being one of the seed of Abraham, that means being in Christ. That means being baptized into Christ. That means being a member of the church of Christ. That's, that's the spiritual Israel. Someone says, well, James, are you a Jew? Yes, I am. Sure am. Romans 2, verse 29. He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is out of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. When you're talking about a Jew, when you're talking about a child of God, you're talking about part of the covenant uh, being a, a child of Abraham. We're not talking about circumcision of the flesh. We're talking about circumcision of the heart that makes you a Jew. That makes you a part of the spiritual Israel of God, the spiritual nation of God. How do you get circumcised? How do you circumcise the heart? How do you become part of this great nation? Colossians 2, verse 11 in whom, that's in Christ, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That can't be physical. It has to be on the heart. In putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him to the faith of the operation of God. God performs the operation of circumcision upon the heart when you're buried with Christ in baptism. And you're raised, you're raised to walk in newness of life. You're raised from the dead. Just as God raised Christ from the dead, he'll raise you from the dead from the watery grave of baptism. And you can become a citizen in the nation of Israel. Spiritual Israel. The great nation of God. What's going to make this nation great? Again, friends, it's not going to be. It's not going to be brick and mortar. It's not going to be walls and doors and gates. It's not going to be trade and commerce. It's not going to be making the dollar uh, stronger. <clears throat> it's not going to be uh, building roads and infrastructure. It's not going to be jobs. It's not going to be a greater education system. All those things can benefit, and all those things will be blessings. But the problem is America will always be on a decline if we think that greatness only comes through military power and education and jobs, strong dollar and so forth. If that's the way we think, we're going to miss it. We're not going to be great. And we'll go down in the annals of history just like Babylon, Greece, Rome, and all other nations that forget God. You may read about us in history books. You may not. You might find archives and artifacts of the great United States of America in a museum somewhere. When we're gone from history, except in what's written out in books, what makes us great is not the physical things, friends. 
That's foolishness. What makes us great is by getting back to the Word of God. That's why, that's why we're here. That's why we're urging people. Look, it's, it's, not, it's not enough to say just go to church. You need to be in the Lord's church. If you want to be serving God, righteousness. Remember what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar? Righteousness is what's going to make you great. Righteousness. And I'll leave you one verse. Acts 10, verse 34. Peter said, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That is what's going to make America great. Righteousness, serving God according to his will. Friends, out of time. If we can assist you, we want to do that very thing. Here's how you can reach me. Word from the Lord at gmail.com. 276 340-2653. Make America great again. Let us study the Bible with you and help you become a member of the Lord's church. Till next time, thanks for watching. Always remember to make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.